everybody and welcome to Law and Crime. I'm Jesse Weber and thanks for joining us here on the program where we cover the most interesting live trials and legal stories in the news today. We're going to be live in two different courtrooms and we're going to break down a lot of stories so let's get started. All right we're learning more about how the apparent murder weapons were processed. Remember this revolver and rifle were found uh, by this abandoned Honda where we believe the uh, shooter or shooters had left the scene. We also find out what was going on in that BMW where the defendant was collapsed outside of. Again, as we said, there was a, a, a rifle bag with no rifle in it. There was bullets in there. Uh, his, his driver's license and a bank card were in there as well, the defendant. So we're learning more about this. Uh, I'm now here joined by trial attorney Brad Micklin to break it down. It's a complicated case with a lot of different players, but the interesting part about it is they don't all seem to be innocent people. So Mr. Verpagel, whose house this was, he's already pled guilty to federal drug and weapons charges. Uh, he's going to be a key witness for the prosecution, saying that he was the intended target. Uh, Sean Henry is one of the victims is accused of being involved in illegal activity. What's your thoughts on this case? It's a complicated case. You have a lot of people, you have a lot of moving parts, and all of the potential witnesses, like you were just naming, are going to have credibility problems and probably recollection problems if there's drugs involved. So I, I think it's going to be a long way before we even have insight into where this goes. Now, the defendant says that he's the victim. He came over that night just to talk to Verpago because Verpago was having some sort of conflict uh, with, a with a business associate. Again, they were involved in the legal activity. Now the idea of where he shot, because the defendant, it was shot, what does that tell you? It looks like he was fleeing. It doesn't necessarily mean he didn't do the shooting or wasn't involved in it, but he was certainly trying to get away. Yeah, he was shot in the uh, lower back and the buttocks region, so you kind of get an idea of what's happening here. All right, so as we learn more about the evidence, and they're, I can see how they're linking uh, the defendant to the shooting, um, it's a complicated case, but one of the things that's on the line here is the death penalty. Now, the death penalty here, this would be a rare thing if it were actually imposed uh, in this case. Am I correct in thinking about that? Yes, it's been a long time since they've executed somebody in Florida. And I believe even the defendant's attorney at some point was trying to have it declared unconstitutional but unsuccessfully. Even though this case, and I'm always curious about this, we were covering Timothy Jones, you know, clear-cut case, a guy murdered his children. You can see the evil there. You can see what this is about. This case has a lot of different players, a lot of moving parts, um, and I wonder that if he is ultimately convicted, because it's, and again, it would be a horrible crime if he was ultimately convicted of, do you think it would rise to the same level of a death penalty eligible case as it would in something like we're covering where the father kills his kids? I think so, because we have multiple victims, we have drugs, and probably no, I hate to say, no legitimate reason, no defense, no fear for his life. So whether or not all these parts lead to a conviction is the real question. But once they find that he did it, I think it's a death penalty. You case. said not fear for his life, but if he shot and he's saying he's the victim and he went to just talk, uh, you know, I wonder if it's going to be a tough question for the jury at the end of the day, because we're also waiting to hear the testimony of Charles Verpagel, whose house it was. He's going to be a key witness, and the defense has already been attacking his credibility so far in this trial. Yeah. I think the finding of guilt is going to be more challenging than the imposition of the death penalty. Yeah, that's a really good point. Look, and Charles Verpagel, I, I love this from yesterday because he said originally three guys came in, they were wearing masks, they opened fire. Well, when a CSI was on the stand yesterday, the defense said, okay, did you, uh, did you find the masks? And she said, well, what, what masks? Mm -hmm. That's a great point right there. There's a lot of issues with a lot of statements that were made, but all of the individuals, whether they're victims or defendants, a lot of them are claiming shock. And right. that could lead to an explanation as to why we're getting different stories. I don't know. A mask is pretty easy to spot. Right. So we're finding the murder weapons or the apparent murder weapons. We're seeing where the defendant was found. We're learning a lot more about the crime scene in these cars. You know, as we look at this, Brad, one of the things that I always get struck by is how thorough an investigation is, especially in these kinds of shootings. They're digging holes to find whatever they can find that's detected you know, by metal detectors. They're looking at shell casings, projectiles, and a, and a shooting like this, when you have so many different elements, I wonder how complicated this makes it for the jury to follow. Um, but at the same point, it just shows how thorough uh, the state and um, you know investigators were in ultimately gathering enough, ev enough, e enough evidence to go after the defendant. It's a challenging balance because, as the witness earlier said, they collect everything, whether they know if it's important or not, because at the time they're collecting it, they can't be sure. But then there's so much evidence that they have to provide to the jury to make sure that they sort of cross all their T's and dot all their I's 
that it can become overwhelming and confusing, and that could be used as reasonable doubt. Well, how, okay, so I think we, I think the defense is about to cross-examine. I was about to ask, what is the defense going to do? This is my answer right here. Now, this defense attorney has been really good to watch, really raising some interesting points here. I mentioned earlier yesterday the, uh, how he said, well, where are the masks to a CSI? Uh, where are the masks that, you know, Charles Vorpagel had mentioned? These men came in wearing masks. Did you find masks? And she said, what masks? So I'm curious to see this line of questioning. I don't think he has started just yet. Uh, Brad, let me ask you, before he jumps in, what do you expect him to ask under cross-examination here? Well, I, I think he's going to hammer onto the mask issue, like you said, and, and issues about the uh, inability to tie the defendant to the actual gun. I think there were bullets found, but not the actual gun. There were rifles found, but I don't know if the rifles did the shooting. So there's a lot of ambiguity between what was found and what was actually used, and I think they're going to exploit that. Yeah, and maybe find some information that they can use to discredit uh, Charles Verpago, who will be a key state witness. Let's go back live. So you just got to take it like it is. Take it, the crime scene, as you find it, but that doesn't tell the real story. Is, am I understanding that correctly? That's what he's trying to do under Cross? Yeah, I think so. So he's, it's sort of like he's building a house. He's got a lot of things he's got to show right now. He's just kind of laying the foundation to suggest that maybe the evidence that we hear and are going to hear wasn't really accurate or it was disturbed or there's some other reason it's not credible. It's interesting, and I say this because I'm waiting to hear what ultimately happens with the testimony of Charles Verpagel, the state's key witness. The state says that the defendant, along with another man, went to that house that night to kill this man. Uh, so obviously he's going to be a key witness, but he himself is in prison. He's been uh, found guilty and uh, pled guilty to federal weapons and drug charges. How reliable of a witness will he be? They've already been tacking some of his stories, how they keep changing, and maybe they can use what this CSI just found to kind of hurt his credibility later on. All right, welcome back, everybody. We're waiting to jump live into the Christopher Vasada trial. In the meantime, uh, Brad, I just want to talk to you. We, we had been mentioning Charles Verpagel. This is whose house it was where the sh shooting took place. Uh, the, def the prosecution wants to say that the defendant went there with the intent to kill this man. We think he's going to be a star witness for the state. He himself is in prison on federal weapons and drug charges. I just want our viewers to listen to this. So because investigators were looking at his house when this shooting happened, they recovered so much evidence against this guy. They found so many weapons in his house, a total of uh, six guns, an assault rifle, a loaded semi-automatic pistol. But listen to this. They found more than 900 Xanax pills, 16.9 grams of cocaine, three pounds of marijuana. So if you're the defense attorney and you're waiting for Charles Verpable to take the stand and testify against your client, for lack of a better word, you got some ammunition. Oh, a ton. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that he's lying if he identifies the defendant, but it is so easy to, to cross-examine and to destroy this man's credibility. I wonder, you could say, you, you want to blame this man because he blew up your whole enterprise in a way, right? But, yeah, but they're going to say that he's lying because he got favorable treatment or a favorable sentence, and it probably isn't accurate. He probably didn't. Well, he's in eight years in prison, 29-year-old guy. Uh, I think he was 28 when he was ultimately sentenced. But uh, we're going to go back, I think, into court. We can jump live, and I believe this is a continuation of the cross-examination of this CSI. So let's go back live. All right, so as she goes through this uh, paperwork right here, going through these documents, uh, what other witnesses are you looking forward to seeing? And we keep talking about Charles Verpago. Any other witnesses you'd be looking forward to in this case? I'm interested to see the first responders. You know, in the cross examination when he opened it up, he spoke of that she wasn't the first one there, that there were several others trancing through the scene. And I'd like to know what they did see, what was originally there, what did they consider important, what did they overlook? Because I think that's really going to go to the heart of what was there and what ties the defendant to whether he was framed or whether he did it. It's, a, it's complicated when you have a shooting like this, right? I mean, shootings can be pretty chaotic, multiple victims. It's hard to know who did what. Well, this is horrible because we're thinking common sense. like. So if he shot in the back, he was fleeing. So if he was fleeing, he must not have been the shooter. But if there were two shooters, the other one may have just wanted to take out the second one so there wasn't a witness to it. We just don't think along those lines. It could have been he was one of two shooters, and they shot him in the back with hope that he wouldn't identify the first shooter. Yeah. Um, let's jump back live into court right now. Again, this is cross-examination of one of those CSIs. Yes. All right. So, Brad, we're watching what the, the defense is doing here. What are they trying to do here? Show that there was 
other other aspects, other alternatives of what really happened that night? That's what I was thinking. Maybe they're trying to suggest since there were so many guns around and so many people involved that maybe a different gun was used or there was a different shooter. And talking about a different shooter, in their opening statements, they mentioned this guy named Luke Kosokis, who they say is the real killer. He's never been arrested. The police are refusing to answer questions about him. Uh, the the co-defendant of Vasada is a man named Marcus Stewart. So what do you think is going on here? Uh, they, do you think that they have room to point the finger at this alternative suspect and say, look, our client, he was the victim. He got shot. You have another person that really was not uh, thoroughly looked at. I think it gives the defense a great opportunity to say it wasn't me, it was somebody else, and that other person is being protected, so you're never going to hear the story. Yeah, and again, one of the theories that's been alleged is that there was a conflict brewing, be brewing between Charles Verpagel, whose house it was, Sean Henry, one of the victims, and this guy, Kosokis, and that the defendant was merely just trying to ease tensions that night. What's your thoughts on that? It's hard for me to understand what his role is there because also I think that um, um, Bobagol also, I don't know, Vopagel. Vopagel had said he wasn't an invited guest in the beginning, which is an odd phrase. Either you're a guest or right. you're not. It's a good point. Complicated case. We're going to follow more of it, but we're waiting to go live in Jones. Stay tuned. When we come back, we'll be live.